So we've been going through a reset this year, <clears throat> and we just finished a series in a, a, on our true identities, and we've been talking about the negative labels that we keep replaying in our minds, and we've been taking those and replacing those with God's truths so that we no longer have to spend our lives trying to figure out who we are. And if you missed those past services, I really encourage you to go check those out on our YouTube channel. And today we're shifting our focus towards identifying and stepping into our callings. Maybe you've been drifting, wondering if you'll ever make an impact on anything. And maybe you want to make an impact for God's kingdom, but you have no idea what you're even called to do. Or maybe you know what you've been called to do, but you haven't taken that first step yet. Or maybe you're like me and you're already on your journey, but doubts keep creeping in, making you wonder if you're really doing what God wants you to do or life gets difficult and you feel like giving up. So the reason I chose this study called Adamant by Lisa Bevere is because before we can successfully and fully step into our calling, we need to set a firm foundation. Otherwise, we'll end up on unstable footing that just shakes us and pulls our feet out from under us as soon as any trouble comes along. And we, can be, we can't be like the rest of the world that quickly gives up or changes their beliefs with the change of the wind, constantly searching for the truth. We need to stand on truth. We need a firm foundation. And in this Bible study, Lisa Bevere uses the analogy of an ancient legendary ore called Adamus. And it was a mythical ore in ancient Greece that was supposed to be the hardest in the world. It was indestructible and unbreakable. And I know some of you are etymology fans. So if you look up this word, Adamus, it used to be associated with diamond or lodestone. But you'll see that it eventually turned into the word adamant, which means untamable, invincible, unshakable, unwavering, immovable. As Lisa Bevere says in this study, in the midst of all this confusion and comparison, we must turn to Jesus. He is our rock, our adamant, unmovable and unshakable. We are invited to fashion our lives in him, not just on him, but in him as our firm foundation. He is the only sure footing in a world littered with gravel. King David says in Psalm 18, one through two, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. His truth is the foundation we have to stand on if we want to be able to stand with solid footing. Because when the attacks come, and they will come if you're going to do as well, it's going to cause you to doubt. When you're attacked, and you will be attacked, the enemy will twist scripture and use it against you. So you need to know what God's word actually says, not just what you believe, but what he's actually saying in his word. And not just for your own sake, but also for the sake of those you're shepherding. And you will be shepherding someone to some degree if or when you step into your calling. You need this firm foundation because you're going to have doubts. First, you're going to doubt your own understanding of scripture. It's good to have an open-minded faith. There's a difference in being open to what Jesus and the Holy Spirit are revealing to you in scripture and being swayed by every interpretation of scripture some human gives you or in reading into scripture what you want it to say or believe it's saying. The enemy is clever and deceptive. And when the enemy sees you as a threat, he'll come after you. The enemy will twist scripture, often cherry-picking verses and taking them out of context. And the arguments will sound convincing, making you second-guess yourself, doubt yourself. It's a classic trap. It's the trap that started everything in the garden. And the enemy keeps using this same tactic because it works. It works to lead so many people astray from the truth. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. The enemy tells us we have to choose between truth and love. The enemy tells us we can't love others and give them a safe place to get to know God without condemnation. The enemy tells us we have to instantly proclaim our doctrinal stances on everything, making sure that we let every nun know what we're against instead of what we're for. This is not the Great Commission. 
Jesus did not say, go ye therefore unto all nations, declaring your doctrinal stances, forcing your religious convictions on them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is not the gospel. This is not good news. Jesus faced the same twisting of scripture in the wilderness, and he fought back with the word of God, with scripture. And we need to follow his example and do the same when we're attacked by the enemy. Know the truth and know scripture. And I know that that's a daunting task for many people, but don't worry, because I'm providing resources in that Bible app link on how to read and study the Bible for yourself so that you can learn to tell the difference between God's truths and the enemy's lies. And I also have a video by Tim Mackey explaining the basic premise of Christianity. And I would recommend that everyone watch it regardless of how long you've been a Christian, because the good news has been skewed. It's been so skewed that many well-intentioned Christians don't even know what it is anymore. So that's in the Bible app link as well. And second, you're going to doubt your worth. And I think we all do this, especially when we're loaded down and believing all the negative labels placed on our lives. But the truth is, your past doesn't define you. God wants to be close to you. Like we talked about last time, He loves you and wants to be in direct relationship with you. He wants to draw near to you. One of my favorite quotes in this study is when God draws near to us, it's not to condemn us, but to intimately gather us to himself so we can hear his voice declare the truth of who we really are. This truth is we are not the darkness of our past. We are not defined by our mistakes, gender, or any external thing. Rather, we are spirits created in the image of God, fashioned for intimacy with the one who gave us breath. We get so distracted by external things that won't last, physical, per physical appearance, or our genders, or our current circumstances, our relationship status, our past mistakes, the lies that are spoken over us, and we lose sight of who we truly are. We are so much more than any of those things, and none of those things will last. Our bodies won't last, but our souls are eternal. We are spirit. We are immortal souls created in God's image, and he has placed eternity in our hearts. And that means that our souls won't be satisfied with any of these things we keep distracting ourselves with. And God knows this about us much better than we know it ourselves. Lisa explains in this study, You don't know what you look like in the spirit. You think you're only speaking words, but you're speaking fire. You are speaking things that separate with light and truth, the lies of the enemy that have been on people for so long. You are speaking fire that melts chains. You need to stand on this truth. And she goes on to say that God speaks to you as you will become, not as you are. He has so much faith in his plan for your life. He knows us better than we do ourselves because he sees our spirit. He is adamant in his love for you, untamable, invincible, unshakable, unwavering, and immovable. Paul says in Romans 8, 38 through 39, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. We keep making everything so complicated and we keep forgetting that we are children of the Most High God and He makes us worthy through His Son, Jesus. He wants to heal those broken and darkened places within you. And the Holy Spirit is ready and willing to walk you through it. But He's not going to force you. You have to let Him in and trust Him to do a good work in you. So don't believe the lies that you're not worthy. If God is asking you to do something, he makes you worthy in his power, not your own. And he will give you the power and the help you need to get it done. He loves you and he has faith that you'll succeed in your calling if you let him guide you. You are worthy because he makes you worthy. You are loved because he's adamant in his love for you. God is adamant in his love for everyone because God is love. And it's what he commands of all of us. Jesus says in John 13, 34 through 35, So I give you now a new commandment. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. 
For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you are my true followers. Something very interesting that Lisa Bevere brought up during this study is yet another thing that I hadn't thought about before, at least not in this way. Because I grew up believing that God was judgmental and hateful, I believed that he would only love us if we did what he asks, and I now know that that's, this is not love. And I now know that the God I grew up learning about wasn't the true God. It was a God formed in man's image based on conditional love, and that is not God's true nature. God is the essence of love. It's his very existence. We love because he loved us first. John says in 1 John 4, 10, This is love. He loved us long before we loved him. It was his love, not ours. He proved it by sending his son to be the pleasing sacrificial offering to take away our sins. And it's very important that we get this. His love for us is not based on what we do or don't do. He loves us regardless. But that doesn't give us license to do whatever we want. There are things that God hates. And to be clear, God does not hate people. There is no person that God hates. But there are behaviors and attitudes that God hates. And we often skip over these things because we want to focus on the love. And it's good to focus on the love. But we also need to know what he hates, which is not at all what you may be thinking. Lisa Bevere says in this study, But because God loves everyone, he cannot love everything. Since God is adamant in love, he must also be adamant in hate. This may seem like a contradiction at first, but that's only because our culture has idolized love. We know that God is love, but have we made our idea of love God? The truth is, God hates what unmakes love. He hates what tears apart those he loves. This is why God must hate what distorts our identity. This is the very definition of sin. Anything that unmakes us or unmakes love is missing the target of God's perfect love. All of these rules and laws that are handed down by God were made to prevent us from harming each other as well as ourselves. They were based on his love for us, and those laws are there to protect us from ourselves. King Solomon gives more insight into what God hates in Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six evils God truly hates, and a seventh that is an abomination to him. First one, putting others down while considering yourself superior. Second, spreading lies and rumors. Third, spilling the blood of the innocent. Fourth, plotting evil in your heart toward another. Fifth, gloating over what's plainly wrong. Gloating over doing what's plainly wrong. Sixth, spouting lies and false testimony. Seventh, stirring up strife between friends. These are entirely despicable to God. God hates anything that tears down others. God hates anything that causes harm to the people he loves, and he loves everyone. That includes anything that's hurting you or tearing you down, or making you think you're anything less than his beloved child. This would include social injustice. This would include gossip and racism. It would include slander which means spreading lies or talking bad about others in order to damage their reputation. It includes looking down on others and causing division. It includes oppression and subjugation, subjugation and abuse, celebrating the downfall of someone else. It includes Christians who are supposed to be united under the banner of Christ fighting and attacking each other. This one's a plague on our society nowadays. Many people cherry-pick out certain sins and villainize them over everything else, and then use that as a platform to do the very things listed in this proverb scripture. Putting others down while propping yourself up, spreading lies, plotting evil against another, spouting lies and false testimony, stirring up strife amongst friends. Paul says in Romans 2, 1, No matter who you are, before you judge the wickedness of others, you had better remember this. You are also without excuse, for you too are guilty of the same kind of things. 
When you judge others and then do the same things they do, you condemn yourself. All of these things tear down and hurt others, and we are all guilty of doing these things, including me and including you. But again, I want to make sure we all understand that God does not hate the people who, that do these things. Remember who the true enemy is. God's true battle, and therefore our true battle, is not against humans. Paul says in Ephesians 6.12, We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. This is the true enemy that keeps setting the same trap that we keep falling into. But we're not off the hook for our own destructive and unloving actions. But the good news is that because God is adamant in his love for us, he is adamant in hate towards anything that unmakes us and unmakes love. And that's why he came himself in human form to confront those evils and take those consequences on himself in order to save us from ourselves. And he did this because he loves us. God doesn't hate us. He hates the behaviors and the attitudes that tear us down. And he hates anything that unmakes love. So we need to be aware of this and equip ourselves with scripture and remember to focus on our own growth before we start worrying about what everyone else is doing wrong. When you do this, you'll see there's plenty to work on without worrying about anyone else. Another one of the great quotes from this adamant study is what we should concern ourselves with first and foremost is whether we are living holy and transformed lives. As we pursue the Lord, we can then ask for the wisdom to reveal his kindness to the world around us in a way that invites them to find their own transformation in him. So it's not about us trying to fix everyone. Lisa Bevere goes on to say, The holiness and transformation we seek in our culture is not going to come through our judging and condemning it. But when we address our own issues first and then release God's kindness, mercy, and hope to those who need it. Paul says in Romans 2.4, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Not his condemnation, not escape from hell scare tactics, but his kindness, mercy, and hope. So when we step into our callings, we need to be careful that we don't fall into the same trap of twisted scripture that so many of our fellow Christians have fallen into and become guilty of the same sins of unmaking others and unmaking love. And the third thing that you're going to doubt when you're attacked is whether or not he's actually called you to do what you're doing. We do need to be sure that we are hearing his calling and not just listening to someone else telling us what they think we should be doing or what they don't think we should be doing. We answer to God, not humans. So it's good to keep yourself in check on whether or not you're in God's will. And we'll get more into that in the weeks and months to come. But I can quickly say, if you think you know your calling, test it against scripture. Not twisted scripture, but actual scripture, because we're at high risk of reading into scripture what we believe, instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal what it's actually saying. Take an honest look at scripture and take an honest look at the approach of what you believe is your calling. If it tears others down while building yourself up or unmakes love in any way, it's not from God. And with that, I leave you with these questions. What are the areas where you feel like you're standing on gravel instead of the rock? Why does God's kindness in our lives demand that we extend kindness instead of judgment to others? And what gifts has God put on your life? How could you fan those into flame? And we will continue to study this in future services because I believe a part of my calling is to help you step into yours. And we'll continue looking more into depth in how we go about identifying and stepping into our calling so that we can start living our lives with purpose as his saints. And again, check out that Bible app link. The Bible hyperlink section has more scripture references for you to read the, more than what we've covered here. And if you want to dig deeper on your own, which I highly encourage you to do, scroll down to the Keep Studying section, and I've included a link to the full course of this study that we did on the Messenger app, as well as the book that the study comes from. And I've also included some resources on how to read the Bible as it was meant to be read. 
look for the self-reflection section and I post some questions there and you can check those out and really take the time to dig through those and think about how they apply to you specifically. So I'm going to pray us out and then we will continue discussing this in Discord off stream. And I invite you to stay for that discussion in Discord off stream. And for those of you watching this later on demand, I'm going to include that Bible app link in the show notes. So I'm going to pray us out. Thank you so much, Father, for, again, giving us this time to listen to what you'd have us to hear today. Thank you for your adamant love for us and that you are so in love with us and you have so much love and protection for us that you will do what needs to be done to protect us from ourselves and from the enemy. Please help us to know your scripture the way you truly meant it to be said and not read into it what we think it says, but understand through your Holy Spirit what it's actually saying. There's so much we're missing and so much we're losing by not listening to your Spirit as we read. Please help us to learn to do that. Help us to learn to read your words to us properly the way you meant for it to be understood. Please don't let us forget as we go through our lives and our own journeys, remind us. Have your spirit with us, accompany us on our journeys and help us to listen to you and hear you and be able to distinguish your voice from our own voice and from the enemy's voice. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.